Hello, I'm Angela Piva, Chair of the AES New York Section. Today's panel is Audiobook Spoken Recording Word with industry experts Erica Glynn, Simon & Schuster, also moderating the panel, Richie Romaniello, Penguin, and Timothy Warner from Audible. We'll take a look at some of the tips, tricks, and techniques involved, as well as their workflow and how they got started and offer advice for those interested in learning about this field. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Angela. It's good to be here. Good afternoon, guys. How you doing? Great. How are you? We're, I'm good. I'm good. Um, so, Richie, why don't we start with you? Um, we'd love to know um, a little bit about yourself and your background in um, audio and how you got started mm -hmm. and how you ended up in audiobook recording. Okay. Well, it's actually pretty uh, unusual because, first of all, I didn't even know there was a such thing as, as a matter of fact, they didn't even call them audiobooks when I started in 1985. But I, I started uh, as a kid. I had a tape recorder when I was 10 years old and uh, did background uh, for my GI Joes and later moved on to audio letters between my cousin in Las Vegas and myself and my family. And then Lo and behold, uh, when I was 26 years old and didn't realize I was going to have a career in audio, um, got a grant to go to the Institute of Audio Research, uh, got out of there. And since uh, September of 1981, I have been uh, supporting myself as an audio engineer. Originally, I started in the music business at a small studio in New Jersey, where I met my mentor, who was uh, doing a guest uh, engineering job there and he absolutely hated the studio we were in because he worked at Abbey Road from 1958 to 1968. His name is Malcolm Addy and we were doing uh, a big band recording of uh, Jimmy McGriff album called Skywalk uh, and we did all live in the studio. We had a full horn section of uh, five saxes, four trombones, four trumpets, Kenny Washington on drums, Kenny Werner on piano, Jimmy McGriff on Hammond B3, um, Jimmy Ponder on guitar, and um, all in the same room, 24 mics up, going to 24-track machine, and we recorded for two days, did two punch-ins, that's it, just two punch-ins, and uh, mixed on day three, and the record was done. And uh, I've been Malcolm's assistant since 1983, done about 200 recordings with him. And because I had worked with him, I sent a resume to Bob Katz, the famous mastering engineer, uh, to do location recording with him. And uh, he also did the maintenance for Cadman Records. And they had fired the engineer there uh, in September of 1985, or actually it was probably August. And um, hot, he suggested me to the uh, people at Cadman Records, and I went in for an interview, got the job, thought I'd do it for six months. And I was there for nearly 25 years, uh, probably recorded about 2,000 audiobooks, or maybe not recorded 2,000, but I've worked on at least 2,000 different titles, either recording, editing, mixing, mastering, remastering, um, whatever. And um, absolutely fell in love with spoken word. Um, I, you know, the, the, my first day on the job, uh, Ward Botsford, the executive producer at Cadman at the time, said to me, you know, this isn't like recording Bob Springsteen. You've got to capture, I swear he said that. He said, you got to capture everything from a whisper to a scream and you can't ride the game. Yeah. I said, oh. I had I never heard the term room tone until I stepped into Cadman, but um, I, I had no I mean I knew what ambience was, but I had never heard the the term room tone, and um, it was uh, the first couple of books I did were just amazing. I uh, one in particular, and most of the early stuff I worked on came out as LP, but uh, a memorable one that I did was uh, recording. Uh, Glenn Close reading Sarah Plain and Tall, which she starred in the television movie version of it with Christopher Walken. We did the audiobook first, and um, that was when we would have music composed for every title, and they were roughly an hour long because it would 
uh, that's about what you could fit on an LP. Where was the studio? We were at Broadway at 68th Street, 1995 Broadway. Um, I recorded um, in 1988, I recorded uh, JFK Jr. there reading his father's book, Profiles in Courage, um, and which was the first of 13 Grammy nominated titles I worked on. Now, somewhere on my profile, somewhere on the internet says I worked on a Grammy winning title. That's not true. Okay. I would love to take credit for it, but I didn't. I was working, you know, there were many Grammy winning titles at Cadman and Harper Audio while I was there, but I didn't work on them. So um, I can't really claim that, but I did work on 13 titles that have been nominated for the Grammys. So what was and, the process like? I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. No, 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 it's, it's fine. <clears throat> what was well, the process like of, of, of um, putting together an audio book in the 80s for an LP? Well, you know, the first thing was, is there was no such thing as simultaneous release. So I would record a title and I wouldn't edit it for six weeks, you know, just do other stuff and I'd work on other stuff. And um, so we would, we would do is we would do a rough edit of it. Usually we did a two pass edit, do a rough edit where you got all the outtakes taken care of and, um, and then go back and pace it because they really, at Cadman, they wanted to eliminate all mouth noises and uh, breaths that stuck out. And, you know, you had to record like an entire reel of room tone because it's not like you could use the same piece over and over again, like you can in a digital workstation. Mm -hmm. And um, so we would get a rough edit. We would send that to the person we uh, hired to compose for it. They would send back uh, a list. I mean, an hour title would have 10 music cues. Wow. And uh, and they would tell you, OK, this starts on paragraph three on page 27. And so the music would I mean, it would be written for that specific point in the book. And mm-hmm. uh, on Sarah Plain and Tall, we the, the composer, I can't even remember his name anymore. Somewhere I have his business card and uh, it was just gorgeous. I mean, it was, you know, real instruments. Um, and it was just beautiful acoustic music. And, uh, so Sounds once we expensive. get that back, yeah, <laughs> it was very expensive, but, we, and we paid terrible. I mean, I, we paid back then 600 to $750 per title for music, but we only did 30 titles a year. Then that's not that much money. Now I'm at Penguin Random House. We might put out 2000 audiobooks this year. What was your journey from Cadman to Penguin Random House? Well, I was at Cadman became Harper Audio in 1987 when we were purchased by Harper and Row. Then we were purchased by Collins from England, uh, the Rupert Murdoch company, and became Harper Collins. But we maintained the Harper Audio name and we've o- they always maintained and they still maintain the Cadman imprint because they still have audio Cadman started in 1952 with Dylan Thomas reading a child's Christmas in Wales, probably the one of the most famous spoken word uh, audio books ever made. And it, I mean, it still sells to this day. And we had a, a library of about 40,000 reels of tape that I set up in a warehouse in Hackensack, New Jersey. Um, and originally I was going to have the archive moved to the World Trade Center, which would have been rather disastrous because um, there there was a a storage facility Mm -hmm. below there, a real high-end storage facility and got obliterated. But um, it was a real process. You know, we, 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 we spent time, you know, I would spend, you know, days, weeks editing a a one hour title. How long would it take to record it? So is it um, well, similar? Well, that particular title, she um, she was interesting because she literally, I'd never seen anybody like physically like change themselves to become a different character. The, there are four main characters in, in Sarah Plain and Tall, and I'm talking about Glenn Close. And she would literally, it was like uh, the elephant man, like uh, in terms of like just becoming a different person. Um, uh, that, so she'd be, that sounds loud. <laughs> well, it, I mean, it was just, you know, she would just <clears throat> morph into this, into the characters. Right. And, but I'm saying like her acting. Yeah. But she, I mean, she wasn't on the mic. There were, no? Well, and that was a problem back then because analog tape, as a matter of fact, that was the first 
that title is the first time I experienced print through on a, on a analog master. Wow. Um, and fortune, and we were recording then with Dolby SR, which was much better, uh, for that sort of thing. But, um, it was just to see that happen and to, and then cut it together and hear this incredible performance was then I got it, you know, it mm -hmm. took, you know, for me at first it was just a job and then it became a passion and I got to work with just some incredible people uh over the years just absolutely incredible i pinch myself i mean i worked with oliver north while he was on trial not that wow. uh <laughs> that's something yeah. to to be necessarily uh boastful about but it was just to be in washington dc while he's on trial and he's recording his audiobook was just a, a pinch me moment um and i worked uh, elbow to elbow with rick harris who was just the greatest uh audiobook director and producer I've worked with uh, for 18 years at, at Harper. So um, I, it just was a wonderful time. And he was very responsible for bringing in stage people to do audiobooks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, that has been a big improvement in, in the wonderful world of audiobooks. I mean, when I started, it was all celebrity talent. Uh, it was Christopher Plummer. It was Glenn Close. William F. Buckley, um, just all these, uh, you know, very well, JFK Jr. And then uh, when I worked with him, then 10 years after that book came out, uh, Caroline Kennedy came into our studios and read a new introduction to it. Um, you know, so I, I, I worked with Newt Gingrich twice. Uh, I know, well, no, no, oh, yeah, I, I know it's, you know, yeah. we, we, we do, we're professionals. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with Donald Trump. Um, I went to Trump Tower and recorded him. All, all I can say is just what I expected. Right. Um, right. Um, well, I, um, I want to get back to you and, and get into some of these things, but um, I'd love to find out some about Timothy here and mm -hmm. his background. What's your background in audio and, and how did you get into the audio book world? Uh, sure. Well, I mostly come from like a visual arts, electronic media background. And so that's uh, where I spent a lot of my early years in, um, eventually ending up teaching at university. And I knew someone who actually worked at Audible um, and decided to have him come out to speak to the students about uh, audio, both as a uh, artistic medium, but also as something that someone could have a career in. And in a roundabout sort of way that actually brought me to Audible itself, where I took what I knew about audio engineering, um, took what I loved about spoken word and storytelling and began, it's now like a 10 year journey through the magic of audiobooks and spoken word, um, both uh, you know starting off as a, an engineer and as a director, eventually working my way up to um, celebrity projects and then things outside of single voice like multicast narrations and things like this. Um, taking as many sessions as I could just because I loved uh, the work and I loved working with the actors and I love working with uh, the technical side of it as well. It was kind of what I liked about everything I liked about the technical side of audio recording as well as the experiences of storytelling. Um, it all came together in this particular medium. I really felt like I found what I've been looking for the entire time um, in my own creative works. And um, at some point in that journey, I uh, looked around at a few of the other engineers and decided that uh, in addition to the work that I was doing at Audible, uh, we would create our own audiobook studio um, and uh, work for Audible as a third party outside studio. Um, and we did, and we actually had two different studios here in New York uh, at different times. And uh, unlike a lot of recording studios that I've worked with as a director or as an engineer, this was our studios were specifically set for audiobook recording only, basically, um, which I think was a real advantage to um, what we did. And we were lucky enough to stay busy constantly with all the um, sessions and emerging projects that were coming through for us from Audible and other clients. Um, a side note to that is that for fun, the thing that everybody knew about me 
uh, and my own pursuits outside of uh, my love of audio and audiobooks specifically is that I was constantly traveling. And so I'd spend a few uh, weeks every year, or a few months every year, if I was lucky, uh, traveling outside the country. And so at this point, I'm up to about 80 different countries. And this was something that I always just did for fun to sort of uh, gain a better understanding of the world and the people that are in it. Uh, but at some point, uh, those two things came together um, in the sense that uh, Audible was looking for someone who both had an experience in production and was familiar with the Audible way of working, uh, but also someone who didn't mind hopping on a plane and going anywhere in the world to uh, uh, you know, further our production uh, efforts in different places. The traveling uh, mm -hmm. for me for, for years was really mostly just for fun for myself. Uh, but eventually I became uh, lucky in that uh, Audible also needed someone who could uh, go to certain places and talk to these different studios uh, in different parts of the world and uh, use them as production facilities, as third party production facilities in different areas of the world. And for me, it was like a natural fit because I was able to travel with no compunction. It was easy and I was used to it no matter where it was. But also all of that time that I had spent like running my own studio really allowed me to have these conversations with people in other parts of the world in their studios and basically say, hey, this is how I did it. This is what worked for me. And to be able to field those questions from them as they're learning in a lot of cases, like a new medium. They may be a studio who had a background in dubbing or had done things for films or other types of uh, audio or even visual uh, recording. Um, that needed to learn uh, some of the ways in which uh, we could make uh, audiobooks and not just make them, but also efficiently and ways that made the actors comfortable. Um, and I was able to take all of those things that I'd done previously that I thought didn't connect, like teaching at university, like traveling constantly, mm -hmm. and all of the work that I'd done as an engineer and a director, and bring them all together into this new thing. And that's what I still do today. That's amazing. I like that story um, and that journey. So what, so what is your typical day like now? Well, I mean, typical... maybe not now in the <laughs> pandemic, but you know, right. you know what I, we're getting at here. I think I can answer this. Yeah. My <laughs> typical day now is uh, not like, is not typical, unfortunately, um, due to cer certain circumstances that uh, we're all still uh, working through. Uh, but typically what I would normally do um, is I would be on the road quite a bit. Um, I would be going as much as one or two weeks out of every month uh, to different places to speak to the studios, to sit in on sessions, to you know, further our production um, efforts in different places. Um, and I'm glad that I was able to do that for several years before this happened, because what I do now is fully reliant upon those relationships mm -hmm. that I was able to build um, by showing up to these studios in different parts of the world, making those connections with them. And so that now when we have all of the challenges that we've all faced the last year, um, I'm able to really know what they're going through. I'm able to have a personal connection with these creatives that we work with. And we're able to continue on production uh, in a lot of ways that um, you know still amaze me uh, how much, it still amazes me how much we've actually been able to accomplish during this really difficult time. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about um, <clears throat> the transition that the, the field has gone in from, you know, like analog to digital, but I guess I should say a little something about <laughs> my experience. Um, I, um, like a lot of engineers, um, started off as a musician, you know, singer, songwriter, guitarist, um, and wanted to make my own records and be able to record and was very interested in the recording process um, and started working for um, a record producer and mix engineer, Bob Power, um, in Midtown and was his assistant for a number of years and got a lot of amazing experience there. And he happened to share a studio space um, with somebody um, who was going to be recording an audiobook, and they asked me if I wanted to engineer. And I said, sure, I'll make some extra money. That's great. And um, I ended up um, 
doing a good job <laughs> and they wanted to keep hiring me. Um, and it was Simon and Schuster. They were, they had, they have a studio in house, but they uh, also have to rely on a lot of um, other studios. And so um, I kept saying yes to them and um, they kept asking me. And then eventually I was kind of was like, oh, I really like working with these people on interesting and smart projects that with interesting and smart people. Um, and, you know, um, as you both have mentioned, there are some really interesting people that you end up working with. I mean, I really like the um, in-house team at Simon & Schuster, you know, the executive producer, the other producers, the other engineer, you know, everyone on staff is really fantastic. But then you also work with you know, like Hillary Clinton or something like that. Um, and that was really interesting. And it was always one of the things I also like about that, um, the audio book recording process for me is that it's very intimate. You're spending like a certain amount of time with these people with, you know, I engineered for a long time at first. Um, I now mostly direct, uh, produce, direct and do post-production. But, um, you know, it's you and you're, you're the engineer, the director, producer, and whoever is reading, you know, the reader, and you end up in a very um, intimate setting with them for four or five days or however long the book uh, or project is. Um, and so it's been this wonderful um, part of my life that I have relied upon while I also get to do music and um, have a family and all these other things that happen in life too. <laughs> um, so that's my experience mostly. Um, so we started to talk about, and, and, and we all kind of went back in time because I have been doing this for a long time too. Um, and when I started, they were called, more so called books on tape that we were not using tape. Um, and now mostly everything is a digital release with some, um, I mean, you know, like download releases as opposed to CD or whatever. Um, where do you think, and you, anyone answer, um, where do we think that the, um, do you want to like comment on the transition of where we think things are moving, you know, towards in the future? Can we even guess? <laughs> Wow. Um, well, I mean, <clears throat> no matter what we do with it, it's going to be some sort of downloadable format, I think, going forward. Uh, physical copies. But, um, do you make it, physical copies still? Some some stuff still comes out of CDs, but Same. less and less every every release period, so to speak. Um, so, but um, you know, it still comes down to until they have artificial intelligence, and I'll be uh, out of the business by then, I'm sure. Um, I'm, I, I know that, that, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, artificial intelligence. Uh, I mean, we're having people have their stuff proofed with artificial intelligence. There's these proofing companies out there, which, you know, actually, I found I didn't realize this until very recently. And, um, I, I just, I can't imagine how that can replace the real thing. I really don't. Um, it, it's not capable of, of the in, infinite amount of nuance that a human being can emit. So uh, it's still, it's no matter how good it gets, it's still going to be finite. And the thing about human beings is their, you know, the ability to do things is infinite. And um, so I'm very grateful that I won't have to be around when they start selling that stuff because I, it just, it, it just the concept that <clears throat> I find disturbing. Um, Tim, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, aside from like the advances in technology that uh, we're mentioning, um, I guess the thing that's exciting for me when I think about the future is the idea that more people are going to be able to listen uh, to these works in easier ways. Um, and I also think that uh, I'm also excited by the idea that uh, we're able to, especially in the work that I'm able to do, 
is that we're also be being able to incorporate more stories from more different places and to have those stories be heard by more people. So uh, it's not um, correct to think that everybody has access to this technology or that it makes it uh, accessible to everyone. But uh, I will say that um, more and more people have iPhones or similar that are allowing them to hear these things and also to really curate their own sense of listening. Um, I think even what we see with uh, some of the streaming services for video starts incorporating the listening habits uh, of the listeners as well, who also want to hear uh, things in a serial way, or they want to hear a series that has multiple seasons in the same way that they would for the visual medium. So yes, all the technology stuff is interesting, but ultimately I think the thing that I'm excited about is the uh, listening habituation uh, that we're seeing uh, with listeners around the world and also being able to incorporate these different voices and different languages from you know increasingly diverse places. I mean, that's the thing, right? This is like the oldest, you know. This is form. the oldest I art mean, form. Yeah, it exactly. Is. Storytelling. Yeah, right, exactly. And uh, what I would actually like to see <laughs> is um, higher resolution audio recording of voices. I've been a proponent of this since I got into the business in 1985. Uh, everybody relegates audio, spoken word audio, to the like lowest common denominator uh, medium of the day. And I find that actually is, is just, it, it irks me to no end. We have the ability to record uh, very high definition and storage is cheap and sending audio is cheap. Uh, you know, Cornell University records bird calls at the highest possible <laughs> resolution in the world. Birds have a lot less uh, uh, frequency range than a human being has, as well as um, amplitude. And uh, to relegate it to 16-bit uh, 44 <clears throat> one um, is, is a bummer because there's, there's so much nuance that isn't getting caught. And if, you're, if you have somebody in a good room, you can really catch so much beautiful nuance. It's true. It's true. You become really intimate with the dynamics of um, somebody's voice and range mm -hmm. and expression when you just have a really good mic in a quiet room. Yep. That's um, the most important thing, the room. So um, I'm wondering about, you know, podcasts um, as the publishing houses seem to jump on um, on podcasts, you know, Apple added podcasts to iTunes in 2005, and it seems like um, audio engineers who are working in publishing helped produce and establish podcast standards early on. Um, and now that they're like mainstream in media and our culture, I'm wondering if you guys have any thoughts on this for the AES members and also on techniques for recording and working on podcasts. Well, I, I don't listen to many podcasts and I haven't recorded any, but generally what I have listened to, the biggest problem I find with them is people are in rooms that are sheetrock and have no uh, acoustical mm -hmm. dampening whatsoever. I, to me, that, that, that's very difficult to listen to. And people use uh, often use their computer mic <laughs> and it, it's... You know, and I'm, it's not that I'm an audio snob. I've, you know, I, I, I don't have a problem with like poor quality, like a great performance on a mediocre recording is much better than a mediocre performance on a great recording. So, um, you know, content is always the most important thing, but most people's rooms are just too lively, just too That's, weird sounding. I, for my I taste. agree. I've, I've heard that too. Tim, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I absolutely love it. And I say that as an engineer, and I say that as a fan, I mean, I listen to at least 15 hours of spoken audio a week, probably closer to 20, um, from all sorts of different sources, including scripted things, unscripted things, podcasts, audiobooks. I mean, I'm fully in there, and I would be doing that even if I wasn't working in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and I fully agree that um, one of the things, I, I would say this, when I think about podcasts specifically as a medium and especially as a listening experience, it reminds me of the early days of the internet when uh, it democratized ways in which we were able to 
broadcast our own information without a gatekeeper and put up our own information onto the internet, which was great. At the same time, that was also the difficulty because there was not always that uh, quality that came with it. And so um, I think uh, when we look at like the older websites from like the 90s and stuff, we sort of see that the quality of them began to improve and a lot of like the poor quality stuff began to fade away. And that's similar to the way I think about a lot of podcasts in the sense that, you know, even five years ago, there was this influx of podcasts and uh, it was great because we we're hearing a lot of new voices, but at the same time, some of those new voices were recorded poorly or were difficult listening experiences or the content wasn't great. And so I think that we're at an interesting moment now where a lot of those um, uh, concerns are actually being addressed and people are making better sounding podcasts. They're actually having uh, editing that goes along with them. And while those things uh, do not make great content, they certainly can add to that uh, substantially. And I know for me, even if it's a, someone I'm really interested in hearing as an interview, if they're recorded in a poor way, you know, perhaps I might switch to something else. Um, I'd rather have a mediocre, uh, a mediocre sounding recording and a great performance or a great uh, bit of content than the other way around, as Richie mentioned. But at the same time, like allowing those barriers to fall away and allowing the higher quality content to emerge makes it easier for the listeners to really get in there and enjoy that exactly. content. Yeah, I, I know agree. there's a couple that I've been like. Um, I'm I, I just so distracted. And I do recognize that some of it is because of the work that I do. Right. Um, but sometimes I'm just like, are you kidding me? Because it's like a, you know, a famous person. And you're like, yeah. what, what is happening here? Why is this happening? Um, but yeah, I do wonder how much it is like the audio nerd part getting in the way. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, until... You know, most people don't hear the ambience around them in their own homes and out in the world. And then, and, and the thing is, is as, as humans, when you're in that place, we have the ability to, um, to discriminate and kind of put that stuff aside and not focus on that. When a microphone can't do that, microphone hears everything as it is. And once and once you take out the visual experience and it's now it's a different time and place that you're listening to this audio, all of the stuff in the background becomes much more noticeable. Absolutely. And uh, it, we, we're, we have the ability to, to like filter out people's mouth noises when we're talking with them and all that sort of stuff that you so, don't get. So speaking of which, speaking of which, um, <laughs> let's talk about some technical tools and methods that um, you use i mean um you're still you're are you are you still um doing any hands-on um technical work tim, like I, these I, days no oh, tim sorry because i no yeah, no I, that makes I sense assume you, i assume yeah, you yeah. are richie <laughs> no i'm well <clears throat> go ahead tim first yeah these days i don't get to work directly in the studio as often as i used to um uh, at least for audible i mean in my own time as soon as uh my day is done. I waddle over to my own recording studio and work there all the time. So uh, yes, I'm still constantly working on technical things. And I have a, my own podcast that I produce and do you know, front to end uh, everything in it, including the voice work, the sound, everything else. So uh, I do get what to see that? that. I'm going to keep that separate, uh, okay. that world okay. separate from the what Got I it. do uh, professionally. However, it's the same thing as, as it's similar to what I mentioned previously about these things that we do in life that sometimes seem completely separate from what we do professionally and that we start to understand that they actually play a pretty big role in our understanding of what we do. And so some of the work that I put myself through when I'm doing my own uh, work for fun on the technical side has actually allowed me to be a better sure. engineer and Absolutely. to have those conversations with other creatives who are doing their work. But can you tell us more specifically things that yeah. you're not, not, you know, you can keep it separate, but tell us about the methods or the tools that you use for recording your podcast and stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention like one technical thing and then one thing that I think surpasses even that. And um, 
I will say uh, personally, this is just me speaking personally. I love all of the isotope stuff. I really think it's a uh, life. It's my. It's a it's a lifesaver, and there are plenty of others that are out there too that are also great. But uh, if there's one, when people say, "Can you recommend?" Yeah, I mean, if which I, which I thing in, in isotope do you use most? RX and ice and RX and uh, ozone constantly. Mm -hmm. I think they make a huge, huge difference. And there's a lot of other great ones as well. But those are the two that I've relied on in different versions for the last uh, 10 years. And they make such a difference. And it's also, it's like a magic spell when someone hasn't used one of those or something similar to it. And they first discover it. Uh, and this is something that I encounter quite a lot as I'm working with people who are new to the audiobook medium. Uh, they see that and they're like, wow, I wish I would have known about this particular tool or a tool like this before. But I think even beyond any specific plugins or anything like that, the thing that I always say is, um, you know, when we are working in audio, we're creating like a magic spell that's really intimate for the listeners. And that anytime that there is something that breaks that magic, that's what needs to be looked at. You know, people say, do I need to cut out every breath? Do I need to cut out all the mouth noise? all that other stuff. And, um, you know, some clients prefer it that way. And that's totally great. Right. Uh, but for me, it's like, is this a noise? Is this a performance question? Is this a voice choice that is going to be distracting that I think is going to pull the listener out of that moment mm -hmm. and break that spell? And if it is, I feel like that's the thing that needs to be focused on. Um, a lot of the other stuff, I mean, aside from us that are in the industry that are listening for this, that are trained engineers, a lot of that stuff is going to be lost on the average listener, but if there are distracting elements in that that break the spell, those are the things that need to be uh, dealt with so that they can have a seamless experience. Absolutely, the you know the better the editor and the edit, the less you know they were there, and you know it, it's amazing. You know sometimes I would labored for for days and days and days on on short titles. Um, because it just, it was that much work to really do that much editing, but make it sound like there wasn't that much editing. Um, and a lot has to do with the performance, but you, you can mangle a performance with bad editing, or you can enhance a, a performance with good editing. Absolutely. Are you, uh, are you what are you working on? Me pro myself? Tools. No, yeah, I don't mean a project. I, I, I just meant like yeah, I, I mean, work. Yeah. I work on Pro Tools. I learned on Sonic Solutions in mm -hmm. back in 1995 because at that time, uh, Harper, we bought three workstations, uh, Sonic Solutions. They were the only one that had a software-based uh, denoising program called No Noise, and um, and their editor was the best editor I've ever worked on. Um, so wait, Richie, mm -hmm. your your experience <laughs> must be just incredible to go from slicing tape um, to you know isotope. Well, the first thing it was it, we switched to digital at Harper in 1995. I was 40 wow. years old. I'd never really worked on a computer, so I had to learn computers and digital audio workstation at the same time. And at that time, the way Sonic Solution worked is your EDL uh, was on a, a hell, kept in a separate place from the sound files. And so, you know, I would save a project and I couldn't find it. I mean, I was just, I was completely computer illiterate. And uh, so it was a real challenge. And, it, and Sonic amazing. Solutions was not an easy, intuitive um, uh, workstation. It was a great workstation, but it was not easy. Um, Pro Tools was much uh, more uh, like attuned to the analog engineer moving mm -hmm. to the digital mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. it, it mimicked the analog world better than other. Um, but now it's become a very good thing and I, I like it just as much. Um, and I, so I use that. I do location recording. I have a 24 track um, machine that I use uh, to do music the uh, recording live um and uh, that's an elisis that's a lot of fun to do um it's so fascinating um 
I can I can just uh, um, imagine. I think it's um, and that's an incredible journey, Richie. Um, I, we only have a couple of minutes left, um, and I kind of want to get to something that I think maybe people would be really interested in um, in terms of like actual work. So work is generally freelance, um, with some positions available for full time audio engineers and producers. Um, now you guys are both. Um, full time. I'm. I am not. I'm a freelancer. Um, so, do you guys have any advice for people starting out who are looking for work in this field, or perhaps would like to learn techniques for spoken word recording? Uh, well, I'll go first if, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, at at uh, Penguin, we use. Um, and and our New York studios operate slightly differently than our California studios. Uh, we have four rooms in New York and we have 10 rooms in California. In New York, generally there's um, a director and an engineer, two, two humans, as well as the talent. In California, most of the directors also run Pro Tools and there's my colleague there is is their safety net if, if Pro Tools crashes or, or you know they have trouble sending files. Um, so there's, you know, there's in New York, generally we have two sets of ears listening as it's being recorded. And generally the engineer is marking the script. Um, so what in, in the California, they, the director is running Pro Tools, marking the script, sending the files. They're doing a, a lot more work there uh, in, in that sense. Um, but uh, th so there's, we do use freelancers at our New York studios whenever they open there'll be some work there, no doubt. Um, and I would think, um, you know, CDM, JMM, they have, I mean, they have staff people, but there's so much content now that I do think there's a lot of work uh, out there. I really do. Um, you just gotta, you gotta, it just takes some work to get used to it. You can't just edit an audio book. I've had this happen where I suggested people um, uh, apply to edit audiobooks and you know the first couple times you edit one you mangle it you just you you have to get it it's an acquired learning same thing with recording it uh, a lot of people record too tight I like a little air mm -hmm. um, because it's storytelling it's not selling it's not a voiceover and a lot of people mic it like it's a voiceover and I try to stay away from that that's good advice Tim do you have anything to add to this uh yeah I would say We'll put it this way, like I do a lot of work in India, and I think that's the most vivid example of incorporating all these different disciplines and what one works at. Um, and so when I work with a lot of the studios there, the studios themselves, not only are they doing the work for us, but they're doing all sorts of stuff with film and movies and dubbing and music and sound design and video games and all these other things. And what I think that is exciting about that situation is that when I have a have a um, opportunity to do something outside of just a single voice narration, there's a very good chance that they'll be able to do the sound effects or be able to incorporate music. And I think that that's an interesting way to think about it, even just as an individual engineer, in that uh, you should definitely be focused and competent at the things that you're interested and good at. At the same time, like having some of these other special skills, uh, we're at a moment now where we're getting to incorporate so many of those in what we do in the um, audio medium. So having some additional ability in sound design or music or directing or even voiceover yourself, I think that allows you to be even more viable to someone who's looking for those uh, skills. So, um, and the other thing that's really great is aside from like any sort of formal education, Anything that you want to learn how to do in a DAW or with a microphone or a piece of gear, there's so many great tutorials and resources out there. Yeah. So there's a lot of learning by doing, even creating your own podcast, even creating your own test recordings for voice will tell you as an engineer how to be better at those skills. Even if you have no intention of ever being a voiceover artist or a voice artist yourself, even going through that exercise will allow you to be further educated so that when you're on the other side of the glass, you have an understanding on some level of what that artist might be going through and how you can best support them. 
I often do that. I, since I started doing uh, audiobooks, I uh, every so often I take a couple of pages into the booth and just try to read it just to understand, like you say. And sometimes, you know, for me, the words start moving on the page. And so you understand why people get bleary and that sort of thing. It's hard, hard work to do. It is. Uh, it's really hard work. The, people the, think it's easy. It's the other hard. thing I want to add to this, to this, um, as now a director, producer, um, you know, it's, it's not just the technical thing that a, that someone is looking for in an engineer, but it's also the personality um, and how you work with a producer and how you support them or as producer director, um, you know, having a grasp on the English language, if that's what you're recording is English helps too, you know, um, and, and, and working with, you know, the actor or celebrity or author or whoever it is, um, well, you know, being able to trust that person alone in the room with Uma Thurman or yeah, Hillary right. Clinton or whoever, mm -hmm. I mean, not that she would be alone because she's Secret Service, but you know yeah. what I mean, <laughs> um, whoever it is, you know, that is also a really, really important part of being in the room. Um, so I would just add that. Um, from my experience, you know, wanting to do something is, 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 is a huge motivator. And if you really want to do it, you're going to find ways to do it. Um, and as you go through your journey, you might want to do something different than you thought you wanted at the beginning. Um, again, like I really liked a lot of the uh, people I was working with at Simon & Schuster kind of more than the people in the music world at times. And that was, a, a pull for me, you know, um, mm -hmm. and there's a, a, a lot more to be said on that. But, you know, um, I worked freelance at a lot of studios and I kind of really liked working with the people at Simon Schuster. So I kept saying, I'm available. I'm available whenever you want. Oh, two shifts back to back. Great. Oh, eight days a week. Great. I'm yours. You yeah. know, um, so I think that there's that, you know, ambition, motivation, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, I couldn't, and I couldn't agree. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry, no. interrupt, but I was just going to say <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. And that's that's exactly what worked for me as an engineer, because I am not a trained professional engineer. Um, I could not mic a, a drum set if I needed to. Um, but I was able to take the skills that I had and just take as many sessions as were available to me. And I was lucky in that when I came in, there were quite a few holes in the schedule. And I, always, I would always be the person that signed up for those ones. Uh, doubles and weekends and eight days a week and all the stuff that you mentioned. And I think that that made a big difference um, in my viability as a freelance person. And I can also say that similar attitude um, is something I see in the booth as well with the actors. You know, you can tell, especially with celebrities, there are certain celebrities or actors that are there because they want a paycheck or they feel like their agent put them up to it and that's great. And you can work with them and get them through that and support them in whatever way you can. But at the same time, when you tell, you, you can always tell when someone really has a connection to the material yeah. mm -hmm. and is really passionate about actually giving the best performance there. And they may not necessarily be the best or natural performer, but just knowing that they have that correct attitude, that right attitude, that they want to make this as excellent as they can for the listeners, it makes such a difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think we're out of time now. Um, was there anything else that either one of you wanted to just close with or I think we really covered a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Richie, do you I, have any stories about recording Orson Welles? I didn't record Orson Welles, I, I, <laughs> but I have this outtake. <laughs> have you ever heard the outtakes? I'm fully obsessed with the outtakes and I just shot uh, in the dark, was curious if you happen well, to be around you know, we, during that we, time. We did a recording at Harper that was by Peter Bogdanovich that was about Orson Welles, but I, I didn't get to work with him. I think the, um, the one of the- Wait, what's famous about this Orson? I don't know these these. You've never heard the Orson Welles outtakes? Oh no. my God, they're, they're on YouTube somewhere. Okay. Uh, and there's a, a pinky in the brain parody that's almost word for word of this 
bunch of commercials that uh, Orson Welles is reading, and he is every engineer's nightmare on this recording. And and I've had uh, sessions like that where um, working with uh, a well-known star, I actually thought I was going to have to fight. He was so crazy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, there, there are definitely some interesting personalities you run into. Oh, my God. And I, I worked with a guy who, who literally punched himself because he was so upset with his <laughs> performance. Wow. Yeah. But um, um, all right. Well, thank you so much. Um, this has been wonderful. I have really enjoyed learning about both of you and your experiences. Um, and um, I think we're going to be doing a Q&A. So stick around. OK, and thanks. Um, Thanks to Angela Paiva um, and AES New York. Thank you. Thanks for asking me. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Well, hey there. Um, so I'm Roy Shamir, and I'm part of the AES New York section. We present these events for you guys and hope you enjoy them. Um, today, we're going to do a little live Q&A with two of our panelists. Uh, unfortunately, Erica could not make it today, but um, she's here with us in spirit, and we hope everybody enjoyed the webcast. Uh, I think everybody had really great insight and uh, information about their, their side of how they do things, which is great. Uh, very insightful, really appreciated it, enjoyed it tremendously. Um, I personally don't have that much recording audiobook experience, but uh, my my better two thirds, Angela Paiva, uh, our, our chairman, and I'll just clarify it now, it is Paiva, uh, not Piva, for those that you've confused. Just think of the number pi mathematically and you'll remember. Anyway, um, she's the one with a, quite a bit of great audio book experience, some of it in a shared space with Richie. Um, and um, so I, I know a little bit about it peripherally. Um, of course, recording is recording. And some of the tips you guys gave, like going out on the mic yourself and testing things out or going out and playing the drums for a minute, even if you really can't play them, after you've mic'd them up and you've got everything where you think it should be, you know, if you're sitting around and it's there, it's very informative to kind of learn what the players are hearing, what the the, arc, the actors and the people are contributing. So anyway, enough about me contributing to this discussion. Um, if you guys would like to add anything else, uh, related or unrelated, uh, I definitely want to remind everybody of uh, Timothy's amazing travel experience. And it's pretty astounding stuff when he gets into it. I'm sure the book, if he hasn't written it already, which I should know, will be great. Um, and... Uh, and if you guys, either of you would like to add anything, please do. In the meantime, I'm fielding Facebook for any questions. So if you have any other experiences or stories, um, uh, you know, by the way, Richie, we told everybody what an EDL is oh, okay. at, <laughs> as right. an, at a decision list, right. uh, as we all know from working in Sonics over the years yeah. and, uh, and other places, a fancy name for playlist. I um, actually think Pro Tools, or when they were sound tools, called it that as well. I think you might be right, because I, I actually did work with it at version one. So um, could be the case that sound tools was there. Let me see. I'm just looking at the comments. Forgive me for multitasking. No, 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 it's fine. See if there's any questions here. Uh, oh. Of course, we're getting comments about our dueling ribbon mic shirts. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so right. that was not planned for all of you to know. Right. And Richie was just being keeping continuity. That's right. From the original recording date in order to give the 
perception of it being one live date and uh, we're sorry if anyone was upset with us for having partially webcast this event but we're following in the footsteps of AES because much of AES if you've attended it online is very much a hybrid of webcasts and a live discussions afterwards so we're just following the um, let's see uh, Michael Jung is asking what are some of the mistakes a regular engineer makes when they first do an audiobook uh, that may be hard for either of you to reflect on because you may have to look far this. far back but please take it I, I could do this and I think from a unique perspective because as I mentioned on the um, on the video I am not necessarily a formally trained engineer in the same way that uh, a lot of people that I work with are which I think <clears throat> has its ups and downs but I would say that sometimes if someone is very trained and um, knowledgeable about a lot of the equipment and everything else, I think there's sometimes where we can get lost in that. I think everyone's probably done it where they've tried to over-engineer something. Um, and then in a lot of ways, I'd ha rather have someone do too good of a job than not good, not uh, of a, a good enough job. But um, yeah, overall, I mean, I think like if we're doing our jobs right, especially for audiobooks, like all of the gear uh, and all of the stuff that adds up to it is important, but it does fade away um, and let the performance rise to the top, you know? And um, <clears throat> if someone's overly concerned about every small thing, they may miss the big picture. So yeah, sometimes I see that and I respect that training, uh, always respect that training. And especially for someone who's really good at music or other types of recording, um, but sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes like the simple answer is the best answer. And, um, I think that applies to audiobooks sometimes from an engineer's perspective. So sort of a kiss mentality, keep it simple. Yeah, pretty much. But I you agree. know, I mean, I, I came from a music background and, um, I really didn't get a whole lot of instruction when I got to Cadman and, um, you know, looking back at that, you know, there were things I was just totally unaware of um you know i mean i knew about room ambience but you know the kind of stuff i did you know you really didn't hear a whole lot of room ambience you know everything we did was um, for the most part artificial reverb you know it was either a plate or or electronic reverb um we had a a room that was had tile in it that was originally a bathroom that we would put guitar amps in every once in a while but for the most part you know we had a pretty dead studio that i worked in and then I started doing spoken word. And of course, at Cadman, we, they recorded in stereo when I first started, which was really weird. They used a, a stereo Neumann mic in MS, uh, which is mid-side. And doing, um, you know, when the, when the actor would move, if you had a pickup down the line that their head wasn't in the same exact place, you'd get this weird shift in, in if you were listening in headphones which you got when you listen to high-speed mass-produced cassettes as well. So, um, yeah, uh, we've come a long way since then. So, you know, it's, it's a little, rooms are a lot deader now. A lot of places have these prefab boots, um, you know, Whisper Room, Studio Bricks, IAC, um, and makes a, a big difference. Uh, now they're, they've, they're recorded in a much more dead environment, which is, it's fine, you know, because then you can kind of, if you really need to treat it, it's easy to do. Very good. Um, I, I want to maybe answer that question, even though I admittedly said I don't have a lot of audiobook experience. I do actually have a lot of voiceover experience. And again, I told you about my peripheral experience to audiobooks. So I would just add a couple things. As a newbie, you may not realize you should really record about a minute at least of the room with nothing going on. That's called a room tone. Um, that is essential for the post-production editing of the audiobook to sound natural. Um, and, you know, make sure that if the AC was on when you recorded the voice, the AC is on when you record the room tone. If the room it was a problem, uh, fit, make a sample of it fixed if you can, but remember to recruit it especially how it was, because that is essential for a good edit. Of course, with isotope and stuff, we can all fix these things much easier now, but you want to keep it natural. So that's my one 
point, and my next one would be, you have to learn how to mark the script. That is an essential skill for an engineer that we normally don't have to do much of, although if you think about it, if you do a lot of vocal comping in the R&B and rock world, no one wants to admit how many vocals it might take sometimes. You wish it was one, and sometimes it is, <laughs> but sometimes it's many. You have to keep kind of a, tabs on the one that made the producer or co-producer or composer or artist kind of smile so that you can find it. Uh, and of course, in Pro Tools, that's very easy to do with playlist editing. Um, the other thing that I learned along the way was a Pixar technique, and I've used it for hip hop. And the Pixar technique, what I call the Pixar technique, is a close um, microphone and a microphone about a foot or two away and above. And this allows you to not worry if the artist or actor screams or does something dynamically dangerous because then you have both mics to choose from and fix. Uh, and I, I could tell you that I have applied this with some hip hop artists that are real screamers and I never want to change their style. So I will actually put a dynamic condenser close to them and a condenser about a foot and a half away. And let's face it, air is a good thing when we record, right? I mean, this is something that works with audiobooks and uh, record making. And last thing is stay away from those dynamics. Don't print with too much compression. Don't ever think about putting noise gate or encoding of any kind. Yeah. Make sure it's just the mic as much as you can, a good mic pre, a good mic in the best place in the best room you can. That's my two cents. Sorry to interject so much. But as, yeah. a, as a fellow engineer, I felt I should share that. Um, so let's just see. Is there any other questions? All that babbling didn't allow me to monitor. Um, boop, 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 boop. Sorry. This thing with Facebook is the comments are live, and then there's also comments that people typed in from their desktop. So I got to make sure I'm checking both. You're mentioning that. I might, I might mention one other thing, which is. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, on one hand, we have like, as I mentioned, like uh, that thing I, I mentioned about uh, over-engineering certain situations. Uh, Under-engineering is is not helpful either. And I think especially uh, like generationally, there's a lot of, um, uh, especially when I was teaching, I found that um, a lot of the students who had access to a lot of this equipment um, early on didn't always necessarily didn't always necessarily understand the power of what that equipment was. And I think for some of us who uh, came up in a time where equipment was scarce and expensive, to have all these options that are at our fingertips now is exciting and interesting and wonderful and um, allows for so much more to happen. But um, there's not always that appreciation for the equipment either. Um, or the setup or the technique. And so it's easy to record. It makes it everything so much easier to record, which is great. You don't necessarily need to be fully trained as an engineer to do certain things, especially for audiobooks. But um, to underplay that doesn't help anybody either. And in fact, just makes it so much harder. So um, while I would say if someone's like fidgeting with the mic too much, that makes me a little bit nervous. Someone who's not fidgeting with the mic at all would make me more nervous. So, yeah, I mean, um, it's about applying like the right thing to the situation, I think. Right. You, you could tell, I mean, if the engineer has worked the room or is a part of the room staff, then you can kind of have some faith that they already know where's the right place to put things in the room. But yeah, you'd like to see people show an interest and listen to what's, first of all, like Al Schmidt always said, go out in the freaking room and see what yeah. it sounds like. And yeah. then then go in the control room and make it sure it's captured and sound good. All right, so we have another question from our good friend, Michael Zhang, and I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Uh, he wants to know, I know Richard, you mentioned MS uh, midside, but he's asking more basically, do you record in mono now? Yes. We, straight ahead mono. It's single uh, large diaphragm microphone. We use it, uh, all of our studios have a TLM 103 and an Avalon 737, and then they go into uh, Pro Tools M box, which will change very soon to, I believe the they're thinking about using uh, um, Universal Audio um, boxes. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's and it's pretty straight, you know 
it's uh, not too many things in between and we don't do a lot of processing with the Avalon just a little uh, low-end roll-off and a little compression to keep it from getting out of control and and that's it and, and uh, it's all about the room really you know, that's the most important thing I guess in, in that case having the right gobos if the room isn't great right having the right mic reflector if the room isn't great so, okay, well, I don't know if we have any other questions. Maybe my fellow cohort here, do you see anything else? I, too, am eager to hear the Orson Welles outtakes. I did hear many an outtake in my life. Um, oh, they're hysterical. Like uh, from the Trogs arguing, which inspired... Oh, well, I love that one. That oh, inspired Rob Reiner to do Spinal Tap, as we most of us know. Oh. And uh, I feel like Spinal Tap inspired uh, Fear of a Black Hat, which is another amazing spoof movie. Um, so... No. It doesn't seem like there's any other questions, but this was great. Everybody, we really appreciate your insight and perspective and stories. Um, and uh, love the fact that you guys have these great gigs at Simon & Schuster, Penguin, and Audible, of course. Yeah. And uh, keep on rocking in the free world. Thank you very much for your time. And, and uh, we'll hope to see you around again at another cool event, whether it be live in person or on the Zoom room here at AES New York Live. I want to thank all the section uh, officers and members, participants, that will be tagged properly at the end of this because we didn't do it right as we started the broadcast. Sorry about that. And uh, thanks, everyone. Have a great day. And uh, we'll end the stream here, and we'll have a little private party for a second. Thanks, guys. Yay.